Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Well, this is it. It's our final study in this series, the Book of Revelation. I hope you've enjoyed these studies. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. If you are interested in going over any of the programs, go to our website, l4ltv.com. Click on the previous programs tab. Click on the button that says a study of the book of Revelation. Every single one of the programs in this series is there. It's also an online series that I did during COVID uh, where I went into much more detail. Didn't have issues of time. You can get those also there, l4ltv.com, previous programs tab. So for the last study in this series, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 19, we have the conclusion of the Battle of Armageddon, which culminates with the coming of Jesus. The final battle's outcome is the destruction of the Confederate evil forces and the deliverance of God's faithful people. Satan's two allies have been thrown into the lake of fire. Look at Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The lake of fire described here is not an everlasting burning hell, but rather a description of the earth as it is destroyed by fire. Here there will be an ultimate end to the rebellion against God, the same as we will see in Revelation 20 and verse 14. You see, all who supported Babylon have been killed by the glory of Christ's appearance and are waiting the final judgment. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So Revelation chapter 20 describes the situation during the millennium and the fate of Satan and his followers at the final judgment. Let's go to Revelation 20, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nation's any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So John sees an angel coming from heaven. He's got a key to the abyss or to the pit. He's got a great chain in his hand. He seizes the dragon. He binds him. He throws him into the pit and securely imprisons him there for 1,000 years. This whole scene is expressed in figurative language. The, the dragon is identified as, as Satan, that ancient serpent of Genesis 3, the great adversary of God and his people in Revelation 12. The chains which bound Satan are symbolic. A spiritual being cannot be bound with chains. As shown earlier, the abyss, this pit, is the place where Satan and his demonic forces are confined until they receive their rightful retribution. The word abyss is used in Genesis 1-2. It 
in the Greek, in the Greek Old Testament, to describe the earth as, as it was at the beginning of creation, it was formless and void. In Revelation 20, the abyss denotes that chaotic state of the earth that has been caused by the seven last plagues. Satan is chained in Revelation 20 during the second coming. The desolate earth now serves as his prison for 1,000 years. He is chained there with the fallen angels by chains of circumstances. There are no humans left, none left for him to tempt or harm. Those who died believing in Christ were resurrected and joined the living saints in the clouds, just like Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. Both groups have been taken to heaven. Those who rejected God are dead. All Satan and his demonic forces can do is contemplate the consequences of his rebellion against God. Now, at the end of the millennium, Satan will be released from his imprisonment to perform his deceitful actions once again. Look at Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. While Satan and his fallen angels are confined to the earth, the glorified saints sit on thrones and are authorized to judge. Some of them have never tasted death. They were translated to heaven. The rest are those who were raised to life at the coming of Christ. Many of them died as martyrs because of their faithfulness to the word of God. Among those resurrected are God's end time people who chose not to side with Babylon and receive the mark of the beast. They went to the grave to rest from their labors like we saw in Revelation 14, verse 13. Now they've come back to life, transformed and will be taken to heaven for a thousand years with the living saints. So here we see clearly that the raising of the saints to life is the first resurrection, which takes place at the beginning of the millennium. The rest of humanity will not be resurrected until the conclusion of the millennium, which coincides with Satan being released from his solitary confinement. Those raised in the first resurrection or are the ones that are called blessed and holy because they are not subject to the second death. That will be the fate of the wicked when they are thrown into the lake of fire. Here is the fulfillment of the, prov of the promise given to the faithful in Smyrna that they shall not be harmed by the second death. You can find that in Revelation 2 and verse 11. So what will God's people do in heaven during the millennium? The text says that we will reign with Christ as priests and kings for a thousand years. Let's look at verse 6 of Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Christ's promise to the overcomers in Laodicea is fulfilled. They share his throne. We see that in Revelation 3.21. God's wandering people who often suffered persecution and humiliation on earth because of their faithfulness to the gospel will be exalted to share Jesus' throne. As priests, they are in the immediate presence of God and have access to the records of God's governance over the universe. During their millennial reign, the resurrected saints are authorized to exercise judgment. This recalls Jesus' promise to his disciples that at his coming, he said, you will sit on 12 thrones, 
judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, verse 28. Paul pointed to a time when the saints would judge the world and even the angels. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. It says, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? You see, the saints exercising judgment during the millennium has to do with the question Satan raised at the beginning of the great controversy concerning God's fairness and God's actions in the universe. You know, throughout history, Satan has tr introduced many doubts concerning God's character, how God deals with the beings that he created. But during the millennium, God puts himself on trial to be judged by the humans, the ones that he has saved. He allows the resurrected saints access to the records of the events to find answers to all the questions concerning his fairness, regarding the decisions that he had made. And during that process, God is going to bring to light things hidden in darkness and will disclose the motives of men's hearts. That's 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. The redeemed saints are also able to find answers to the questions dealing with God's leading in their own lives on earth. And at the conclusion of the millennium, all questions involving God's justice are settled forever. Satan's accusations are refuted. God's people can see beyond the shadow of any doubt that the greatness of God's love and that the care that he has shown for every single one of us, that God, in fact, is love, they are now ready to witness the administration of God's judgment at the final judgment. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, that they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So at the conclusion of the millennium, Satan is released from his solitary confinement there in the bit, in the, in, in the abyss, in the pit. Satan's release takes place simultaneously with the resurrection of the unsaved dead during the second resurrection. So if Satan was chained by the absence of people on earth, his release is initiated by the resurrection of the wicked. His release, however, is only for a short time. So Satan now sees his final opportunity to de dethrone God and have dominion over the world. By his deceitful activities, he deceives the wicked that have gathered from all, times period, all time periods against God's people who are encamped in the holy city, the New Jerusalem. Although the descent of New Jerusalem is not mentioned until Revelation 21, it's evident that that the city with the saints inside has descended prior to the time of Satan's attack. So under Satan's leadership, the wicked surround the holy city ready to attack and destroy God's people. But the attack never takes place because God intervenes to protect his people that are within the city with fire that comes down from heaven, destroying Satan and his hordes. In portraying this scene, John uses language that evokes the prophecies against Gog and Magog in Ezekiel, just as, as he used language that referred to Old Testament Babylon to portray the end-time apostate religious system coming to an end 
in chapter 16 through 18. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog are the enemies assembled against Israel and Palestine that will be destroyed by God. And John applies this Old Testament motif to describe Satan's final attack on the saints at the millennium's conclusion and to show God's miraculous intervention in protecting his people. The last attack on the city of God, the holy city, demonstrates the hardness of the hearts of those who rejected God. Even though they have been made aware of Satan's deception, they do not change. Their rebellious hearts are filled with the same hatred against God and his people that they had previously demonstrated. Now, the scene concludes with the total defeat of Satan and those who followed him. Fire is hurled from heaven. It consumes them. Satan and the fallen angels meet their end in the lake of fire, thus sharing the fate of the two other members of that diabolical triad. The text states that they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. As shown earlier, this phrase, forever and ever, denotes a continuation of an action until it completes God's purpose. Satan's punishment is irreversible. All who followed him must share this fate. But God's people, they're safe in the city under God's protection. This is described in detail on, in verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Here's what it says. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So now John gives us a more detailed description of how the destruction of Satan and the wicked will take place. As Satan and his army surround the holy city and are about to carry out the attack, God suddenly appears seated on a throne. God's throne, which has been a source of hope and deliverance for God's people throughout the great controversy, now becomes a source of terror to the wicked. The time has come for the dead to be judged. All the dead, regardless of how they died, are raised at the second resurrection, and they are brought to judgment. People from all time periods... People in every socioeconomic class are there. No one is exempt. All must give an account of the wrongs they committed. The books of records are opened. There's two kinds of books mentioned here. The first books are the records of human deeds showing whether a person has been loyal to God or to Satan. The second one, the second book is the book of life with the names of those who belong to God. The ones whose names are, are not in the book of life will end up in the lake of fire. They are now judged by what was written in the books and according to their works. So as the unsaved stand before God's throne, it's as if a curtain is removed and their whole life unfolds before their eyes. They can see how much God tried to save them, yet they knowingly and willingly spurned his mercy and refused his offer of salvation. Now they realize that they are lost because of the choices they made. But yet they acknowledge God's justice. God's kingdom would not be a happy place for them. They have lived their lives in rebellion against God. So spending an eternity in his presence would not be joyous for them. This is why their destruction in the lake of fire, it appears to be a manifestation of God's mercy towards them rather than a vengeful punishment by a wrathful God. 
And so all who spurn God's mercies meet their end in the lake of fire, which interestingly enough was prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you curse it into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now the lake of fire is not an everlasting burning hell as many Christians believe. Rather, it's a metaphorical description of the whole earth burning like fire. It is significant that John equates the lake of fire with the second death. This contrasts with the first death referred to in the Bible as sleep. The lake of fire refers to complete destruction, not the beginning of an eternally conscious torment. It is the place where all those who rebel against God meet their ultimate end. See, the fire burns long enough to completely consume everything until nothing is left to burn. Its flames completely destroy every root or every branch. Just like it says there in, in Malachi uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, where it says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant, all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor nor branch. Satan, the root, his followers, the branches, they will all cease to exist. The second death also means the end of death itself. It says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. In verse 4, Paul stated that the last enemy to be abolished is death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, it says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Eternal life for the redeemed can only begin when this great enemy is abolished and, e and eternity without sin and sinners is now ready to begin. You know, the future may look frightening, but God will always be with his people until the very end of time. God holds the future in his hands and his grace is promised to all who take the messages of revelation seriously. God's grace will equip his people to go through the tumultuous times of the final crisis. It is through Christ's grace that revelation's promises will become a reality when Christ comes back and claims his faithful people as his bride and brings them to their eternal home. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise that you will never leave us as we face a frightening future. We do so confident that in your grace, we will overcome. How we long for that day when we will see Jesus face to face. Father, I pray if there's anyone watching today, anyone listening to this program that has not yet surrendered to Jesus, may they do so now. Accept him as Lord and Savior, as sovereign over their lives, and in doing so, be guaranteed of an eternal life with the one who died to save them. Father, bless each and every viewer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. We want to thank you, first and foremost, for, for joining us. We've come to the end of our Revelation series. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed putting it together. We didn't get through every single chapter. We just... We're, we're limited in the amount of time that we can spend in the studio, the amount of airtime that we can purchase. And so go to l4ltv.com, previous programs tab. The whole series will be found there. Just click on where it says a study of the book of Revelation. Or you can click on the online series that I did uh, where I go into much more detail. 
If you're interested in exploring more about the book of Revelation, hey, email us info at l4ltv.com or bill at l4ltv.com and uh, I will connect you with, a, with someone that will teach you the book of Revelation or any other Bible truths that you need. Uh, while on the website, why not make a donation? Click on the Donate Today tab if you feel so moved to do so. Follow me on Instagram, Santos underscore Bill. Every morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, I put out a devotional video. Follow me on X, like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, download an audio version of this program on SoundCloud, right? All of these are great ways that we can stay connected between broadcasts. Also, want to uh, remind you of missionnowcanada.com is the website. That is the overseas humanitarian work. We're planning some exciting work over the next little while. Check that out. Maybe you want to join us on an upcoming mission trip or you want to make a donation to one of those projects. We're all out of time. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you'll be back with us again next time. We'll see you then. God bless you. Thank you.